good evening and welcome to Montpelier City Forum. And this is a, a new year of these and we're going to be discussing what's going to be on town meeting day on March of 2019. And we're going to start with the city budget, which is a good place to start. And the best place to start with the city budget is with our mayor, Mayor Ann Watson. Why, hello. <laughs> I and mean, you, you've sat through how many hearings on this already? Oh, goodness. Uh, at least three or four. Yeah. No, it's been more than that. Yeah, I think it probably has, actually. <laughs> what is the budget process? When does it start? So we usually start the budget uh, conversations in November, and then we start having um, a more serious dialogue with the council in December, and then we finalize our decision um, in early January. What is a conversation about it? I mean, every every budget is sitting throughout the entire year and you've got forward planning and then it, it results in a budget. What is the conversation? Just what does it entail? Exactly. Yeah, well, so I think there are um, a couple of key questions that we uh, discuss a along the way. And one is, uh, should we be uh, stopping anything that we're currently doing? Um, should we be starting anything new that we're not doing yet? Um, or should we, or are we at the, the right levels? And. Uh, you know, for a lot, for the vast majority of uh, our budget, uh, we feel like, or usually, at least in my time on the council, um, the answer to most of that, the, um, most of the items in the budget is we're probably at the right levels. Um, and uh, this year, we've, uh, th well, we're dealing with some new challenges. And in addition, um, you know, we have some, some goals that we would like to meet, and that requires some funding. So. Uh, there are a couple of new things, a couple. There's a, there's a, a list of, of some new things in the budget this year, and I think they're all um, needed, and, and I'm really excited to, to get into them. Well, budgeting is always on the margin anyway. Sure. You're not, for the most part, you aren't going to be cutting serious amounts out of a budget. Right. Well, and I should add um, the other factor um, uh, that goes into the budget conversation is what is the the limit? You know, like we already have relatively high taxes, so um, how uh, you know uh, what is our tolerance for um, you know increasing or um, potentially decreasing um, those rates? And so uh, you know, just trying to keep in mind that uh, you know tax rates are high. When the schools come in, the hidden factor is what the state contributes. Right. In the city budget. The hidden factor is health care costs. Sure, yes. Could you talk a, a little bit about health care costs and how they came out? I'm not asking for specifics, but I, I think, from my incomplete knowledge, they came in reasonable this year. Yes, and I can't really speak to it much more than that, but that is also what I understand is that the health care um, uh, increases were pretty minimal, so. Which, Which was really helpful. Guys. Oh, yeah, <laughs> right. It was very helpful for forming this budget. Now, how long have you, have you been on council? Uh, well, I was on the city council um, just as a counselor for exactly. about five and a half years, and this is my uh, first budget as the mayor. So basically, you've watched the health care play out yes. in the city budget over the years. Yep, and there have been good years and bad years. I mean, there was one year where there was a huge spike uh, in health care costs, and we had to work really hard to uh, keep the, in the percent increase uh, relatively low. Now, how do the city contracts play into this? They'll be negotiated after the budget is voted yeah, on. Yeah, they're, they're negotiated separately, and they don't, like the timing of them, um, as far as I can tell, uh, you know, is uh, staggered and sometimes ongoing, so. So really, that doesn't play a factor. We pretty much understand that, but the rough parameters of that budget yeah, before right, we started. Right, exactly. So we've had our conversation, now we're going into December. After the conversation, what happens? Do you set a Excuse goal, me. a percentage increase that you would like to, to target? Well, so we did that all sort of in uh, combination all at the same time. So uh, I think it's really important that we keep in mind that uh, you know we need to be focusing on what the services are that we want to uh, be offering as a city, and then uh, also keeping in mind what the uh, percent target uh, is, and then sort of tweak it from there. Um, and I, where we ended up is a little, uh, not a lot, honestly, it's a little bit higher than I would have liked to have end up, ended up at. But, uh, but overall, I think it's uh, pretty reasonable. Um, and then the other um, 
thing, so just to continue to answer your question. Um, so from here, so the, uh, the council holds uh, a couple of public hearings, uh, which have uh, passed at this point, and that finalizes the number that will be on the March ballot. And so that uh, between now and the first Tuesday in March, uh, uh, voters have the opportunity to check out all this information, which is why we're having this conversation and, and get informed for March. And it's on the city's website. And it's on the city's website. And then if it's the a The annual report will come out. Yep, the annual reports. Uh, yeah, I think we had to have all of our writing I've had to write up a little piece for it, and that had to be in already. Um, and so then whatever budget, um, well, if it passes um, in March, then that will go into effect um, this coming July. Okay, now, for those of you who've watched this before, and I've been doing this for a few years now, you will notice that on your screen is a fancy graphic. The <laughs> fancy graphic has been borrowed from the city. Um, our city manager put this together, so Anne is quite familiar with this. Would you go over the points for us, Ann? Sure. So there is a tax uh, percent increase. Um, I was aiming for more like 3.5% back in November when we were discussing um, the budget. I mean, I think it's always reasonable to incorporate what inflation is, and inflation at the time was about 2.2, uh, 2.3%. 2 um, so I was aiming for about 3.5% uh, because we do have some, um, I mean, if we were doing everything uh, if we were only just maintaining all the services that we provided, then that would have been a, basically a two and a half or a little more than 2% uh, increase. And uh, there are some new things that we're uh, which gonna, we'll discuss, which we'll discuss that uh, are going to be included in this budget. So it does, there is um, some addition, uh, uh, additional cost than just uh, inflation. Um, so that does constitute a, uh, an increase in um, taxes, and then um, now the four cents, just for the record, is yeah. four cents on the hundred dollars appraised. Yes, yes, right. Uh, the average tax bill rising ninety two dollars will be for a house that it, the average house of two hundred twenty two thousand. Yes, I believe. great, thank you. Yes, exactly. Uh, and so, right. So for some people, it'll be a little more, and for some people, it'll be less. And for those of us who've moved to this town more recently than yeah. you and I have, District Heat, what is District Heat? So, uh, and who pays those rates? Sure, so just a little background on District Heat. Uh, so underneath that uh, tall smokestack in the middle of town, which is not actually putting out uh, very much or any smoke, really. Um, anyway, underneath that is, or connected to that, is uh, a wood chip burning plant that's heating hot water that sends hot water t through pipes underground uh, to a variety of buildings in the downtown as well as all the, the um, municipal buildings. Um, and so uh, those rates uh, are unchanged. So okay. that, well, because we approved them earlier in the year. So that's just sort of a note that like that hasn't that hasn't changed. Um, water and sewer. Water and sewer. Um, so there was a planned uh, increase in water and sewer rates um, that was established uh, just a couple of years ago. And so that called for a uh, 3.5% increase. And so as, as per uh, that plan, that's, that's sort of where. Will that be 3.5% every year, or is that just this um, I would have to go back and check. I don't think so. Um, I think that is. Uh, uh, it changes, I think, every year. So, um, but I can go. We can go back and, and look, dig that up. <laughs> um, our sewer plant. Mm -hmm. We voted bond for it. Yes. What is the status on that? Um, I think we're uh, so as you mentioned. So we passed the the bond uh, back in November for that, and I think we're uh, working out uh, the contracts for that now that the money was approved. And I think we're also applying for some significant grants. Uh, to help offset some of that cost. So that we could pay for the whole thing, um, but it's likely that we may not need to. So that would be wonderful if we got some grants to go towards it. Now you and I discussed this last year, <laughs> and when we discussed it, you were talking possibly that it would be generating um, and making money off of generation. Well, so where it, uh, where it landed is um, that it's the, the plan is for it to be generating heat. And so effectively, the buildings uh, on site there with the uh, uh, water resource recovery facility uh, will be 
self-sustaining in terms of uh, heat, which is, which is really wonderful. And the way that we're setting it up, we have the uh, possibility or the opportunity to uh, do some modifications in the future to get it to be uh, generating electricity as well. So that's sort of a phase two, and so we're just going to settle into phase one right now and, um, when and can look we at that. Anticipate soon. that it might be finished in its construction. Well, that's a great question. I don't know. Okay, <laughs> so, no one knows. So. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. How about our how about our the politics of our water plant? And um, upstream. Yeah, absolutely. The, yeah, upstream. yeah. Could you just discuss that for a sure, second? Sure. Yeah. That has an impact on the three point five percent. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, well, I'm, I assume that you're really referring to our, our recent water main um, issues. No, I'm, no, I'm oh, not. Okay. I, I'm okay. referring to getting it up to, to standards, to establish standards. Didn't we have to do some work on our power plant? Or on, on our water, our water plant? plant? Uh, not to my knowledge. Our okay, water good. plant is... Um, uh, meeting all the standards and and has the, I don't I'm oh, you're thinking of um, you're thinking of the wastewater plant exactly. that there was a there was some question about exactly. the phosphorus right. input into the river right um, so yeah so we did just hear recently that the state thought that that our um, levels of uh, phosphorus um, in in the effluent was acceptable which is which is good which is good for us yeah. Where are we on Berlin Pond? Well, we're on water. Oh, gosh. <laughs> uh, well, nothing has really changed. Um, gosh, we haven't talked about Berlin Pond in a little while. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're still of the opinion that, uh, that nothing should be constructed uh, near or around Berlin Pond. And to my knowledge, that the state is still planning um, some kind of a, a boat launch. And, but I don't know where they stand on that. So. So basically, it's a it's a Cold War effort at this point. You know, I right, I, I haven't uh, I haven't heard the latest there, so nothing no, to report. <laughs> no change is required for the sewer benefit. What is the sewer benefit, and what is the CSO benefit? Uh, so the, well, so just to um, to explain the CSO, so that stands for Combined Sewer uh, Overflow. So there are places uh, where our storm drains are connected to the sewer lines. So those are combined uh, sewer overflow points. And uh, so those are, those are charges, uh, so and, and with the sewer, I mean those are charges that are um, so, uh, uh, associated with the water and sewer, um, uh, your one's water and sewer bills that ends up paying for the maintenance of those lines. As, uh, and really the goal with the, um, the combined sewer water overflow uh, money is to uh, help reduce them, to eliminate them, because these are the points where uh, if we have a significant rain event, uh, we might see uh, the, those sewer lines uh, overflowing and then you, you get things sort of backed up and nobody, nobody wants that um, running out into the streets. So. Well, speaking of running out into the street, you mentioned it a few minutes ago yeah. when we were ice skating down Main Street on Saturday. Yes. Can you discuss just briefly what happened at the traffic circle and what happened at Nelson? Sure. Um, at the traffic circle, do you mean uh, Elm Street? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. By the, tra by the traffic circle. Oh, oh yes. Degree. I guess it is right. by the traffic circle, isn't it? Uh, right. So, so. Uh, as I'm sure everybody knows, we had a pretty major leak uh, on Elm Street, uh, and I mean, I got uh, into well, that the- that was the city's boiling instruction. Oh, yes, right, the whole, right. The whole city was on a boil exactly. water notice. Um, I got into sort of the physics of it, like I was very interested in like, okay, so why did this happen? Now, why did you get into the physics? Oh, because I want to know like why. No, what, because you're the what physics causes, teacher at because, the high school. Yes, because I'm the physics teacher at the high school, yes, in addition to being the mayor. Uh, so in any case, um, just a little, a little background on some of this. Uh, we do have a very old uh, water system in Montpelier. I mean, it's, some parts of it are over 100 years old. Um, and actually, it's uh, a lot of the portions that are the oldest are actually not the problem. Um, those pipes are, a lot of them are um, made out of 
uh, cast iron. And there, somewhere between the 50s and the 70s, there were some, uh, the, the new going uh, type of replacement was something called ductile, excuse me, uh, ductile iron. And those have turned out to be uh, corroding faster than uh, expected. Iron. Than the cast iron, yeah. Anyway, um, and so the, those are the ones that are problematic right now. Uh, so when, it was, it, well, and it, one of the things is it, uh, they, they don't, as they're corroding faster than expected, uh, they're, they're, they just end up being a little bit weaker. And so what we um, were looking at really what, with what happened on, <clears throat> uh, with the Elm Street uh, break, so uh, it is really that uh, you know with the freeze thaw cycles, um, the ground is moving a lot, and uh, some of the pipes they just can't tolerate um, that much mo uh, movement if they're not strong enough, uh, or the you know water gets into the the connections um, and it itself goes through a freeze thaw cycle and. <clears throat> and ends up damaging the pipe that way. Anyway, sorry, that's probably more information than you really need, but you know, the physics geek in me really like, like, likes that kind of thing. Um, How much it, of the city is susceptible to that in future winters? Well, that's a good question, I don't know. Um, but one of the things that, uh, so with, with a major leak like that, um, once it was repaired and the pressure was restored, um, there's a phenom phenomenon called hammering, um, where when the pressure increases or decreases rather suddenly, <clears throat> as one would have after a, sort of a major shift like that, um, that can um, cause s waves in the pipes, really, um, uh, in, a, in a physics sense. Not, maybe I shouldn't go too deep into it, but, um, but the point is this, this hammering um, uh, action can also uh, end up uh, potentially damaging some of the, the weak points as well. And that was, uh, so it's kind of like an aftershock with an er earthquake, and so that's what happened um, with the, the leak on Nelson and Marvin and Bingham Street. I understood that the leak on Nelson, of course, I'm the ultimate source for things, <laughs> I understood that we didn't lose pressure up there. Um, that might be. I don't know. Um, that's what the police. That's what the that, fire that, told me. That would make sense. Um, but, uh, but a lot of water. <laughs> but it was well. That's just it. And, you know, it's it's funny that we had. Uh, it, it did flood a lot of downtown, right? Um, but one of the reasons that it did that was because the storm drains were covered in uh, snow and slush. Uh, if if this. If uh, a leak of that scale had happened during the summertime, we would have seen just some water running down the side of the road, and like, oh, this, it gets, there's a little bit of water there. But because all the drains were covered, uh, it, it accumulated. And really, you know, once the city was aware of that leak and they were able to clear the drains, then uh, the water receded really quickly. Uh, so, uh, having said that, it was. It seemed like a major leak, but relatively speaking, was actually um, for for the size of the pipe and and what it was was actually relatively minor. It just accumulated. Oh, it must have been horrible working on those pipes. Oh my it was gosh! So cold. I can't imagine. I'm so grateful. I'm so thankful for our uh, Department of Public Works crew. They've been just working so tirelessly between clearing snow and snow plowing and then fixing these water lines. Like, and then waiting for the spring with the many potholes that have Yes, oh my this. goodness, right? Isn't it remarkable how, uh, you know, over a, a, a matter of 24 or 48 hours, just the potholes are uh, just coming out of nowhere. They're just springing up. <laughs> when will council be addressing the water the water system. Yeah, so, so that people have an interest in sure, this. Sure, yeah. So we're actually going to talk about uh, the water uh, mains and sort of what's been going on uh, at the next council meeting. So that'll be the 13th of February. Which will be on Orca. <laughs> yes, it will. But it's also, you can go down there and <laughs> or you can, can come ask down. Your questions. Probably easier to watch from home, but either way. <laughs> now, you'll notice that we go to the next slide, which, you know, this is a fancy presentation. And this is the slide that the city is using to explain where your $2,566, if you own a house of $228,000, mm -hmm. is going to. Um, let's start with the police. Yeah. We're picking up a new officer in the budget. Yep. So uh, 
just to talk a little bit about why we're adding a police uh, officer this year, um, the reality is that the way that we had scheduled uh, the police officers that we have right now, it was turning out to be very difficult for some of the police officers to um, take time off or to get enough rest, and that was causing some pretty uh, difficult uh, situations uh, for the police officers, if, and especially for the kind of work that they do. Uh, it's really important that they are well rested and ready to, to work. Uh, and in addition to that, we are you know continuing to see significant amounts of um, of uh, opioids and uh, heroin and uh, just other other drugs, uh, you know, passing through the city, and so uh, you know they they have a, their work cut out for them. But they've been uh, they've been doing a, a, a great job. Will overtime be impacted in theory? I, I believe it, it 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 will be. Um, Which in a sense helps pay for the right, position. Right, it but it doesn't it doesn't fully you know it's not going right. to offset it entirely, but or the overtime. So it is still an increase. Um, but even so, um, it, it should help with even just the overtime aspect specifically. Um, other things on here. <clears throat> um, what about our fire? We're, uh, what are we doing with that? Fire is... The paramedic program is expanding. Yep, the paramedic ex uh, program is expanding, but otherwise it's uh, unchanged. Uh, one of the things that we have been looking to do with our uh, fire and EMS is uh, hiring people who are dual certified um, to be both firefighters as well as uh, um, EMTs. Um, so we're going to continue to, to try to do that. Are we still talking to external communities about we have this capacity that the externals don't have? Yeah, well, so that was one of the uh, big focuses of the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority. And we are actually, uh, uh, well, I should say, uh, I've met with Tony as well as Bill, uh, Tony Fakus, our chief of police, and as well as our city manager, to discuss where we want to go with that. And so I'm hope actually really um, excited to have a, a statement to um, come out with. <laughs> Let me rephrase that. Uh, we're hoping to come out with a statement very soon um, about where we hope to go with, with this Will there ever CBPSA. be a unified dispatch <laughs> unit between the towns? I, I sure hope so. Um, that's, Is that's that still effort still? Yeah. Alive? Uh, well, so I believe, yeah, I think the answer is yes, and we're going to talk more about the specifics of how we see it going forward um, in that statement. So okay. that's keep, upcoming. <laughs> keep, um, keep, keep tuned in for this. Yes, yes, exactly. What is Project Safe Catch? Project Safe Catch uh, is a uh, program that was uh, advocated for by our chief of police where uh, you know, which I think really views uh, the, you know, the drug and o uh, opioid uh, epidemic that we have. It views it more as a public health uh, crisis rather than a uh, criminal situation necessarily. So, which is to say that if there is a uh, you know someone who is an addict. Um, that they can uh, turn themselves into the police and get help and um, not... And this effort will continue in this and project. Exactly, yep. And it's been uh, a great help to, uh, to a lot of people. So it helps them avoid um, charges, but get the help they need to, uh, you know, to stop being addicted, to break their addiction. Equipment replacement, that's in the general services, in the government services section of this? Um, sorry, which what were we just referring to? Uh, the equipment plan or no? Yeah, the equipment plan. Would that be in uh, the equipment plan? It's is separate. On, on yeah, the it's own, What it's own is thing. going on with the equipment plan? Is um, that kind of like the streets where we put a certain amount into maintenance every year? No, that the equipment plan is more like uh, vehicles, um, uh, snow plow, like sidewalk plows, or um, you know, buying new light duty so trucks. So it's a replacement or, for for that. Yeah, and there are aspects of equipment that we that are not vehicles, and those are all that's also included in in there. Um, but the, what you're thinking of with the uh, you know maintenance of um, streets and sidewalks, okay. that's really more in the the capital plan. Okay, in the capital plan, we don't have a capital bond issue this time. Not this, not right, not this time around. Yep. Uh, is that good, bad, or just happenstance? I think it's just happenstance. I mean, it's uh, where we. Uh, so we, we do have, uh, have some um, scheduled bonds um, in, over the you know coming 10 years or so. That will expire that we can <clears throat> renew. Oh, well, no, even for like just specific um, projects. Um, 
And, but uh, I think you're referring to the, just the, like the debt, like we're gonna be paying down debt on exactly. some other bonds and that, that, and that will- Again, that's our general indebtedness. Yes, uh, but even so, um, you know, we have some planned bonds upcoming, uh, but none this, this uh, for, for this March, um, but we likely will in the future. Uh, the ballot items, you increased mm -hmm. the funding for that. How much more was, was put into that? Oh, I'm not going to remember these numbers exactly, but it was, uh, we were anticipating um, the scale of something like $120,000, and I think they asked for more like 130, 135. It was somewhere in there, or maybe 140. Um, so there was an increase, um, but, but that was based on the request that went to the um, the board. The yeah, the community fund board, right. um, and then I'm trying to think if there is. And there's nothing on the back of the ballot from someone who is rejected, which I suppose shows that the system might be working. Y yes. Well, uh, if someone goes, if an organization goes to the community fund board, theoretically they're waiving their rights to um, put something on the ballot. In theory. Yes, in theory, and. Uh, uh, but you know that people could just not go with the community fund and put something on the ballot. But parks and trees. We've got two of the. We've got a program coming up with the two people who are running for the park commission. One oh, for yeah, two years right. and one for five years. Mm -hmm. um, we have physicians. Yes. Funded. Could you talk about those for a second? Yeah. So uh, there is uh, a couple of positions that we're adding to the budget this year um, related to parks and trees. So one is a, a position dedicated to combating the emerald ash borer. So that, if, if you, are you familiar with how that, or maybe, maybe I'll just explain it anyway. If you want, yeah, I sure. ask yeah, you too. Yeah, fair enough. Whether I'm familiar with yeah, it. Yeah, it's not important. Question. Yeah, yeah, fair. Um, so uh, the emerald ash borer is an invasive species that has really been decimating um, ash trees. Uh, wherever it's found, and it has been hugely expensive in, uh, to clean up for many communities as their ash trees uh, come down. And Montpelier has a lot of ash trees, so uh, it will actually be uh, cheaper for us <laughs> um, in the long run if we can hire someone ahead of time and be proactive about managing the system so that it's not how would you manage that system if they're all over the place? So, well, so you, one of the things that you now, can- Now, all, all over the place, that means they're in North Branch, they're in Hubbard, and they're in their yards? Yeah, potentially. So there have been a few uh, places located in Montpelier that um, have emerald ash borer, uh, but one of the things that we uh, can um, do to, to slow their their migration or their progress is to uh, purposefully uh, cut down some of the ash trees around infected trees so that they so that it doesn't spread as quickly, and just be you know uh, instead of trying to clean it up all at once, um, you know take it in in pieces. Do we have the resources to cut those down? Well, so we, we just uh, uh, added this full-time position, and uh, you know, there's differing opinions about this on the, on the council. Um, uh, my, my estimate here is that it is probably good to start with uh, a position and then see if that is, uh, you know, really panning out to be as necessary as we think it will be, um, or if they're totally overwhelmed and overloaded, should we be adding um, some extra, either like either position or contracted help? Now we're going to go to the third graphic in our advanced graphics series. Okay. This is the actual budget changes. What is CIP funding? CIP uh, stands for Capital Improvement Plan, uh, and so th this is uh, where the all uh, the funding for roads and sidewalks for their maintenance and refurbishment comes from. And so we have been adding um, to the CIP every year for um, the last many years, except for I think maybe last year. Um, so we are adding in uh, an additional twenty-five thousand uh, to continue to to uh, maintain our roads and sidewalks adequately. Um, this is a part of a, a larger uh, plan to get our um, funding for uh, infrastructure up to uh, sort of a steady state level. Now what is the steady, now I know the steady state, I, even though I can't say steady state level, <laughs> I know that the steady state level means that you're bringing it to routine maintenance. 
standards. Right. Yep. How far are we on the streets now? So we are very close. We're about $25,000 short of that now. So next year, I anticipate we'll add an additional $25,000, and then we'll be at steady state. Now, what does that mean in terms of, of Barry Street? Uh, do you mean in, um, in, uh, the, in terms of... All the potholes, whatever. Right. What does that mean in terms of the streets of our town? Sure. So that would, uh, that would mean that we're funding uh, for, um, that for as many miles of road as we have and are responsible for maintaining, uh, we are funding them at a level that means that we can do... We can um, uh, be doing routine maintenance that will end up... Uh, helping those roads to uh, have their full useful lifetime. And uh, it will mean that we can uh, be doing a, a deep retrofit for um, roads every, you know, something like 40 to 50 years. And a deep retrofit would be something like what we did on Elm Street or, or Northfield Street? Right, yes. Which, you know, roads are going to need um, over the the, the long term, um, but uh, it should mean that our road, the, the life of our existing roads should be extended. Now we see the police officer that we just talked about. Mm -hmm. We see the new tree position yep. that we just talked about. Uh, um, what's the new parks position halftime that starts in January? Uh, yeah, so we, uh, well, it's really full time that starts in January. That's where the half sort of uh, okay. comes from. Uh, but the idea there is that uh, we are losing our, our so uh, our uh, uh, parks director, Jeff Beyer, is going to be retiring um, over the next uh, year Which or so. Which opens a house. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I guess. And then, um, so we'll be, you know, hiring someone to fill his position, but um, particularly with his transition as well as we are adding more park space. Um, and Where is our park space coming from? Where, where well, are we so adding? We're going to be adding Confluence Park, um, which is not a, not a lot, but in addition to that, uh, uh, I would add that uh, there was a sense on the council that uh, that there was just not enough uh, uh, positions dedicated to the maintenance of the parks right now. There is the you know this thought that Jeff works a fair bit of uh, overtime right, right now, and uh, though I don't think it's technically overtime uh, strictly speaking, but he works you know really long days, and uh, so we want to. Uh, honor that and see uh, how it, it works with uh, this additional help. Now, I know that I can't get out of a discussion of the parks without talking about dogs. Okay. <laughs> and bicycles. Yep. Uh, what is the status on dogs and bicycles in Hubbard? Uh, well, so I can uh, tell you that we just opened some new trails over at North Branch Park. I mean, I know that's not Hubbard, uh, but that was very exciting. Um, and uh, my understanding is that, you know, we've posted uh, the, the canine rules of conduct uh, in Hubbard Park and are, uh, you know, hoping that that dog owners and, and odd dog owners will uh, be conscious of what the rules are for dogs and keep their dogs uh, within uh, Control, you know, either within um, voice control or on a leash, and, uh, and that if there are any problems, you know, the police want to hear about it. Is there any discussion whatsoever of a dog park? Um, not yet, but uh, it's it's something that um, well, I've seen it on Front Porch Forum. You know, it's no, it's that, come up. Yeah, and, exactly, that's uh, but why I'm asking. Sure, I mean, it hasn't come up in council, but I think it's something that we could look at in the future. Uh, while we're on bicycles, yeah. What about the scooters? Are they coming back? <laughs> and in what way are they coming back? Well, See, this is the time I get you. No, it's fine. Um, so we actually had it on our agenda to uh, to evaluate, you know, how had the pilot gone and, uh, you know, should we be renewing it? And so that agenda item got pushed back. And I, I think it's, again, it's on the agenda sometime in February, but I'm not sure when. Um, so, 
we'll see. And so it's not clear yet whether or not they're coming back. I think uh, I think there's a lot of interest on the council for that. I will tell you that I'm more. This is just speaking for myself, but I'm I'm very interested in um, electric uh, dockless bicycles as opposed to scooters, uh, particularly because more uh, they might have a basket. But all of that is sort of yet to be. Um, well, there still has out. to be a legal definition of what these things are, from what I gathered. It's a state question as well sure. as a, a municipality question. Yeah. Well, and I would also like to be looking at our, um, even just our, our ordinances within the, the city about uh, electric devices on uh, the bike path. I mean, I know we're, I've seen, you know, electric skateboards and, um, I mean, I would actually really like to get one of these like electric unicycles that you don't sit on it, but that's just like a, some, a, like a platform for your feet. Um, they look so cool. Uh, but How does that differ from a Segway? Um, you're not like hanging okay. onto anything. Okay. Yeah, right, like there's nothing that comes up. But anyway, um, I, I think we could do, both at the state and the city level, I think we could do a lot of work um, clear, uh, cleaning up our, our ordinances and the, the state statutes as well. What's the new facilities sustainability director? Oh my goodness, I'm so excited about this. Uh, so we have needed a, um, a facilities director for a long time. I mean, just the, the classic example here is that in the past, uh, the maintenance of the building of like say the the police station has been left to the police chief right but that's not his area of expertise like he is uh, he's a great police chief uh, but um you know, he's not going to necessarily know uh, what the best uh, technology is for replacing an air conditioning or how to necessarily go about that process. So, um, and plus there are lots of uh, energy saving, uh, just really small things that we can be doing to make our buildings perform better. Uh, and so having someone who is looking out for the facilities as well as uh, for the energy that we're consuming is going to be huge. So this person, in, in addition to um, that, uh, would also be uh, helping to manage district heat. Uh, which right now is uh, under the Department of Public Works, and and you know they've got a lot going on right now. So you know, for example, like trying to find more customers for District Heat, like that is w at least like right now when they've been so busy, right? Like way on the back burner. But this would be a part of their this person's job, um, as well as um, uh, managing uh, the parking garage. Now, while we're on utilities, yeah, um, internet. Yeah, I think. Wasn't there movement on the internet project? Well, so we made some appointments to the Central Vermont Internet or Central Vermont Fiber, and would you explain that project to people who don't know the inside of it? Sure. Yeah. So uh, there is some really substantially uh, faster internet technology that's called fiber, and uh, Montpelier used to be a member of a group called uh, EC Fiber, which was based out of the Upper Valley, and they have brought high-speed internet to rural parts of the Upper Valley, which is really remarkable. Uh, and so Central Vermont Internet, or Central Vermont Fiber, uh, is basically an, an iteration for this uh, of uh, uh, that same type of model, but for uh, for Central Vermont. So the hope is that uh, we'd be able to um, get high speed internet all over uh, all over. Now this we're area. not only talking municipally; we're talking in the households as well. Oh yeah, right. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, extending right. to uh, you know all of downtown, if not out uh, into the the more rural parts of Montpelier too. If this were to roll, when do you think it would roll roll out? Well, that's a good question. Um, I, I couldn't say, but uh, I believe Jeremy Hansen is the board chair. So. Uh, yeah. So everybody look up Jeremy Yeah, Jeremy Hansen. Reason. You and, uh, uh, right, bombard right. him. Yeah. <laughs> so I haven't heard much yet about uh, uh, about but, their timeline, but uh, you know, I'm I feel like I did hear something, but I I, I don't want to speculate. So. Okay. Increasing the housing trust fund. Mm, yes. It's fifty thousand. Yep. And I happen to be at council, sitting in 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 the crowd mm -hmm. when they presented, and I believe they were saying that fifty thousand actually generates funding for them. 
additional funds and actually pays for itself largely. Mm -hmm. Could you explain their, their rationale? Yeah, sure. So one of the things that they uh, do, or one of the programs they have, is the First Time Home Buyers Program. And so one of the great things about that is it, it brings um, more families into town who otherwise would not necessarily be able to afford to live here. Uh, and then, uh, if, especially if they have children, then that means uh, you know they're a part of our count for the school population, and that ends up bringing in um, even more money to the school district. So I know those are two different pots of money, but in the end, um, it can end but up. But they also paying for the, our local funds help to leverage federal sure, funding, right? Sure, sure, yeah, no, right, exactly. I mean, as uh, with so many other nonprofits, if you start with some amount of money, you can, uh, or you know, donations, then that can uh, go to, uh, you know, help leverage further uh, grants and whatnot. And while I have you here on housing, yeah. what's going on with Sabin's Pasture? Anything, any movement whatsoever? Um, well, one of the, the last I heard was that uh, we have some zoning um, issues that were uh, uh, sticky or you know tough to deal with for development in Saban's Pasture and so uh, we're going to be taking those up relatively soon. Um, Weren't those part of the master plan that we just dealt with? Do you mean the zoning? Yeah. Um, right so it's from since then okay. um, the the practice of it right like um, as it has rolled out and we're seeing how it works we've discovered that there are a few things that uh, are not working out the way we anticipated, and so we're going to re-examine a couple aspects. The new art commission funding. What is that? What is the art commission? Sure. So <laughs> we yeah. Funding. So we just uh, minted a new arts commission that uh, is going to be. Uh, I think we're uh, going to be appointing members to it relatively soon. Uh, and so th this is another situation where you know we're going to be giving them money, uh, something like twenty thousand dollars. Yep. And they'll hopefully be able to take that money and then um, leverage further uh, grants and donations from that starting point. Uh, and then they'll have their own processes for uh, for vetting projects and selecting um, locations. And um, you know, we're very hopeful that uh, that we'd have some public art on the the parking garage. Um, and but there's lots of other opportunity uh, for public art. So uh, I'm really excited to see how that works out. I'm going to go for one that's not on there because okay. it's it's not a, an extra funding thing that's significant. Okay. The Invisio dashboard. Oh yeah. Okay. That's one of yours. Yes. Yes. I'm very excited what about. What is this. the Invisio dashboard that's coming in? <clears throat> Well, so as I mentioned, I teach physics, right? So I love data. And uh, we have started a couple of um, have new data um, initiatives with the city. One is around performance measures. So how is, how is the city uh, taking data or collecting data around how well we're doing? Um, and then the other is uh, community indicators. So these are general pieces of data that uh, that we think are important and uh, good things to know about our community. Um, the city itself may not have direct control over these things, but we may have some um, indirect uh, influence over them. Um, you know, there are things like, uh, I mean, for the biggest broad uh, strokes, it's like, um, uh, you know, population or um, you know demographics uh, by age or by race or um, you know looking at what is the median income or uh, or even look I mean we're even drilling down into things like um, you know do we have health data about our population like how healthy are we um, or are even looking at our sustainability like how many um, you know electric vehicles do we have uh, registered in uh, in Montpelier that that kind of thing. Will we go on the level like Burlington does of how many police calls were there or how, well, how much road salt was used? Or? Um, it might not be quite... Uh, that granular? Well, it might not be those things specifically because, um, you know, we want the data to have a purpose, right? So uh, why... Um, you know, thinking about like road salt, right? So like, what... Well, it affects your budget. It, well, it affects the budget, but, you know, in thinking about you know, like a, just thinking about road salt in general, um, you know, we could consider uh, you know, how much salt we're using per storm, 
uh, let's say. Um, or, uh, but I, I shouldn't be making these up because the the city de uh, department heads actually came up with a whole bunch of, uh, of, metrics. of metrics that's uh, in our budget book, and they're wonderful. I'm really excited that we're starting to keep track of these things. And then soon we'll be able to keep track of them over time and see what the trends are. And I think, um, I mean, one of the things that I'm, that I, I, I'm really interested in is, um, uh, you know, looking at how we, we are making improvements. And I'm not sure that the improvements are always very visible. Uh, you know, uh, pavement condition um, index comes to mind, right? Like people might say, oh my gosh, our roads are terrible. Fair enough. What we can show you is that there's a measure for that. And on average, our, our overall pavement condition is getting better. Um, or, it's, or maybe it's not, right? But, like, but at least we have some data that can be objective and, and tell us about um, how we're doing. It's coming to the next one. We've increased our funding to Montpelier Alive sure. by 10,000, yep. and we have our Montpelier Development Corporation at 100,000. Mm -hmm. Have we developed metrics for success on those two that are really a lot softer than pavement condition? Yeah, so we have some pretty clear metrics um, for the Montpelier Development Corporation. That uh, Those came from the um, economic development strategic plan that uh, the city put together a few years ago. And you know there are things like net new businesses and housing starts and jobs and things like that. Um, so that's one. Um, we don't have as well-defined you know, metrics for Montpelier Live, but that's something that I'm, I'm interested in talking about. Um, in terms of the community fund, you increased it 17, 750. We talked about that before. Mm -hmm. Uh, new child care for meetings. I'm oh, sure yeah. that would interest people. What, yeah. What meetings can they get child care? <laughs> well, so uh, we were considering uh, that there uh, may be some impediments for people to come to the city council meetings themselves. So it's this is really for uh, for city council at this point, uh, and it's an experiment. We're going to try it out and see how it goes. Uh, yeah, we want people to be able to come voice their opinions, um, even if they, you know, need to be uh, bringing uh, other members of their family <laughs> with them. Now, I should be prepared for this one. The uh, funding for the energy plan, strategic plan, and community survey mm -hmm. is that at all connected to the charter issue? Um, no. <laughs> okay, I wasn't prepared. <laughs> no, that's fine. Uh, uh, what is that then? So those are. Uh, those are um, three different things. They're separate, uh, and they're, uh, as far as I know, those are things that we are um, looking at coming out of uh, just some some of the extra uh, reserve funding that we have. Um, so the community survey is a survey that we used to do uh, every. I think it's well. We've we've done it in the past, and it's um, you know ballpark fifteen thousand dollars or so. So uh, we may uh, uh, just start allocating some money for that and do it in a couple of years, or we may just do it now. What would the community service tell us that we don't know? Um, it's uh, it's in the past. It has been things like you know where is the public on a variety of uh, of controversial issues for Montpelier. Um, Would this be like the survey that was done for the recreation department? Well, it might incorporate some aspects of things like that, uh, but it'll be much broader um, than, than that. Um, the energy plan is really more modeled after uh, the kind of thing that Burlington is doing. What is the kind of thing Burlington is well, doing? So, um, both Burlington and Montpelier have a net zero energy goal, or I would say um, like an energy independence goal. And so uh, Burlington just hired a firm to come up with a roadmap for them to figure out how are they actually going to uh, achieve energy independence. And, uh, and that this is um, sort of our, our version of that as well. So uh, this is been needed for a long time. I mean, we have an energy committee, but they're volunteer and they're not going to necessarily uh, be able to come up with the, the roadmap. Um, so that's what we hope to get out of that. Yeah. So, and what, is, so what is the charter change? 
Uh, oh, doesn't that did you want to talk about the strategic? Well? Do you want to talk about the strategic plan? Or yeah, no? let's do the strategic okay. plan well, first. Well, so the strategic plan is um, something that uh, we do every year as a, or we're going to start to do every year as a council. Um, shortly after March, uh, as a part of our goal setting for the year, and um, and we have hired a consultant to help us walk through that. So that's what that is. I but anyway, Bill, I thought Bill was doing that now. He had the action steps and all that for your goals. All set for out. this year, but not yeah. for next year. Okay. Yeah. So but he had already started that process, I thought. Um, yeah. Yep. No, we're starting to plan for for expending that money. Yeah. But charter change. The charter change. Yeah. Doesn't that have to do with energy as well? Yes, it does. So the uh, charter. Which is why I got it confused. No, it's okay. Yeah. Well, and understandably so. Fair enough. Um, so the the charter change is about. Um, uh, the city's ability to uh, regulate energy efficiency in buildings, um, and so that uh, there are a few there are a few ordinances that we've been discussing um, with the council that uh, that have some traction, which I'm really interested in and excited to have uh, further conversation about. And to be fair, the charter change is more or less, uh, you know asking permission to have this conversation uh, because right what now conversation right fair <laughs> enough <laughs> so um, the uh, the ordinances that we have been um, discussing so far again to bring up Burlington so Burlington has an ordinance that says that any multifamily building that is sold must meet a energy efficiency performance standard and if uh, it's d doesn't meet that standard then there's a cap on the amount of money that the seller might be required to spend in order to get it up to um, that standard, so as to not prevent the sale. Now, living in a, one of the older homes in Montpelier, sure. living in a 170-year-old home, yep. how do you set standards? So many people here are living in homes yep. that really are 75 to 100 plus. Sure. How do you set a standard for a home that old? Is so, it like an old car where you're going to well, set a different standard? So f first of all, that uh, you know, if it's just your single family home, then that wouldn't be affected by okay. that rule. So it's, it's just multi. Well, that's multifamily homes, right? Because okay. the idea is to protect renters, and particularly because renters have no um, efficacy or agency to um, uh, make the changes themselves in wherever they're living. Um, so multifamily buildings get to that. Could that make since affordability is so difficult yeah. in rentals yes. in this town, mm -hmm. when there are rentals to yep. be had in this town, yep. doesn't this possibly affect affordability since it would be passed through yep. so to tenants? That is, this is exactly like the, the same next question that happens like pretty much every time uh, I talk about this. And um, I think that knowing that that is sort of an obvious predicament, right? That like, oh, is this not gonna increase rents? I think that there are going to be ways that we could frame it so that um, uh, to, so as to deter that. I mean, for example, when um, uh, I mean the situation is a little different with Capstone, but my understanding anyway is that when Capstone um, refurbishes or does weatherization work on uh, uh, a rental property, they have some clause in their contract that. Um, that prevents the landlord from increasing rents by a whole lot because they're getting such a heavily subsidized, um, you know, uh, deal. Now, to be fair, that's also an incentive, but there may be a way for us to. And the intent here um, is to have both um, incentives and regulation at the same time. Um, so, actually, I've been uh, in addition to this um, charter change, which would be the the regulation side of it. I've also been having conversations with Efficiency Vermont to say how can we be um, providing carrots uh, for people to do these changes. So, basically, what I'm understanding you saying. Yeah is that what the city council is looking for right now mm -hmm. is an opening to open a discussion, yes. a community discussion that will result in an ordinance that will have how many hearings? Oh, who knows, right, like right. many, so, at least, well, I should say at least two, but I imagine that we're gonna need to talk about this um, a lot more than that, and, and, and rightly so. And you brought up like, well, how do you set a standards for you know, a, a very old house? Um, 
you know, when it comes down to it, there may be some, even for multifamily buildings, there right. may, there, that question still remains. Um, and I think what we're gonna need to do is figure out like, well, what are the, what are the right dial settings um, for Montpelier? Because, um, you know, certainly the goal is not to make Montpelier unaffordable or shut people out of construction or, um, or um, you know, doing doing the work that needs to be done to weatherize their homes, but uh, we can we can probably find the right levels for our market um, and encouraging people to to get some work done. Now, even though this isn't budget related, yeah, there is an elephant in the room. Okay, the parking garage. Yes. <laughs> can you tell us what is going on right now <laughs> in the legal perils of the parking garage? <laughs> yes. In terms of the planning of the parking garage. Sure. And. Uh, what those of us who've lived here a long time call the car lot or one Taylor Street. Sure. Well, and something I've noticed is that I think people get very confused about these two projects because, I mean, even just today, um, there was someone asking me, like, oh, so they're building the parking garage now over yeah. on, on Taylor Street. Uh, on Taylor Street. <laughs> and I have to say, no, no, that's not the parking garage. That is the transit center. Um, and so. Let's start with the transit center. Okay. What's going on with that? We see that there's movement there. Yeah. What's going on with that? Sure. So, um, th well, it's just uh, it's continuing to be in const uh, uh, to continue to be constructed as planned. Uh, in very cold weather. In very cold weather, I think it's it's good that they've sort of enclosed some of it so they can keep some of that heat in as they work. Uh, so they're starting with the building, and I think I just saw some of the work done um, for the abutments uh, uh, for the the bridge that's going in. That was kind of exciting. And may maybe Only I'm you would notice that. Yeah. Well, I think I saw that. I mean, maybe it, maybe it was just a giant cement thing over there, but I'll have to go back and check. Um, and then, of course, uh, the Montpelier Beverage Building came down, and that site was... Um, what's, what's going on with that site? Uh, well, so all I can say is, uh, you know, in the, the plan is to have... Um, uh, a bike path next to the railroad bridge, and then next to that will be the road that leads behind... Um, Obishans, et cetera, drawing right. board. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of interest, I think, in trying to figure out what to do with some of that extra space there. We have the opportunity to um, uh, maybe extend Confluence Park from the west side to the east side, but uh, we still uh, um, either need to buy out the state's interest in uh, part of the, the parcel that's there, or, uh, or we'll need to sell it and put a building there to pay the state back. Um, so there's, there's some questions that we're still um, sort of wrestling with, and we, we will have a, um, a public process to discuss what ought to be done um, with that site over the um, coming months. So uh, that's upcoming as well. Yeah. Now, well, before we get to the Thorny Garage, yeah. how's the distillery coming? Oh, it's, it's coming great. I was uh, that should be open sometime in 2019. Uh, yes, yes, in a mere matter of months. Uh, so, so relatively soon. Uh, but um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else about the transit center. No, I mean work is continuing, and uh, you know things are good. So. Okay, now on to the parking garage. On to the parking garage, garage. okay. Uh, planning is continuing while the legal thing is being sorted out? Yep, so just to, in case people don't know, just to catch people up, um, the bond passed uh, for the $10.5 million uh, to build it, which would be paid for through revenues um, generated through the parking garage itself, which is great. Um, and then um, it was the, the subdivisions, or two of the, the subdivisions were appealed uh, by a group of people. There are 18 right. folks. And then um, we also went through an Act 250. Uh, Act or, 250 being land use. It being land use, yep. And so that's uh, sort of in addition. So we had our first hearing about that. And there were a number of people who, uh, 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 um, I'm not sure what the right verb is here, uh, peti uh, maybe petitioned for a party status. Uh, uh, to be plaintiffs. To be, yep. And uh, so uh, there was one fellow who was uh, granted party status, but, our, uh, the, but the, the, whole, uh, the whole group is appealing for, uh, for party status as well as um, uh, the one fellow to be party on um, more items than just the one that he was granted. Um, so, 
you know, we'll see. I mean, I, I am. Are the two sides talking, or can't you say? <laughs> well, so I, well, I, I can say that uh, I have a meeting with a, a couple of those folks um, coming up, and um, I'm looking forward to it, and and just talking through um, their concerns, and and you know, want to be just I'm really upfront that like I, I'm really receptive to like whatever they have to say. I mean, I also am a, a young mayor, right? And so I uh, am um, still learning and in that's okay. So in town. In, right, yes. <laughs> and these are our neighbors. And, they, and these are our neighbors, right? And I want to make sure that, uh, you know, everybody feels heard. One more. Yeah. Since we're in that parking lot over by the Heaney parking lot next to um, Julio's. Yeah. The farmer's market. Yes. So we just approved a new, the council just approved a, a plan to have the farmer's market um, be sort of in both places a little bit, the, less so into the parking lot, the Heaney lot there, uh, but uh, spilling out onto State Street. So we can anticipate that we're going to be closing State Street um, often, maybe every Saturday over the summer for the farmer's market between, um, say, like Elm and, and Main Street, which I think is going to be wonderful for, for the farmer's market, for the downtown businesses. Um, I think it's going to create just a lot, of, um, a lot of vibrancy. It's going to be great. When do the main? When do the um, wayfaring signs come? Is that? I don't. I don't know. Happen? I don't know. Uh, I'm. Uh, we did just uh, 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 re recently, like within the last uh, few months, uh, look at uh, uh, approving, uh, you know, the the plan, and so they were going through the DRC and whatnot. But I don't know where we're at with that. But they'll happen eventually. They'll happen they're eventually. The yeah. They're Is there coming. anything else in the pipeline I didn't get to? Well, no, I think for now that's uh, pretty good. Uh, just to add another word um, about this, the energy efficiency um, uh, uh, conversation that I've had uh, with Efficiency Vermont, um, they are, uh, they've put, it to, uh, sorry, blah, blah, blah. They, they put together a program for Montpelier uh, landlords, uh, specifically that the, uh, they're dedicating uh, part of this uh, woman's job to helping landlords um, find all the best deals and help walk them through um, the weatherization process and um, connect them with all of the best rebates and um, the you know low interest loans and and whatnot that that are out there. Well, it sounds like the city is doing some really good things. And yeah, you guys are working hard at it. Um, yeah, and we have a ballot measure that will pay you and the other city council people. And <laughs> I'm sure you're getting rich off. Oh that. yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> and oh, for dear. you who are watching this, I'd like to thank. Ann Watson for presenting her budget and a state of the city, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, get out and vote and make sure that your friends get out and vote. Each of these candidates who's running for school board, who's running for city council, who's running for parks commission is going to have their own television show along with me and watch those because these are good people and basically these are entertaining shows and informative shows, but most important, get out and vote on town meeting day. Thank you very much. And I want to add one thing, if I can, sure. which is to say thank you for being so dedicated to doing all of these, uh, these interviews. I think that's a real public service, and we are all better for it. As is my wife, because she is away from me now. <laughs> thank you so very much. <laughs>